Hey, this is Mike. Charles Woods. And we've got another live video p version of our podcast. And, um, all right, so if I said, put your weight on it. <laughs> you rat soup eating rat mother. Rat soup eating, yeah, right. <laughs> what comes to mind? Charles? Dolomite, I'll tell you. Hey, here's a guy, um, I learned he had diabetes. And he came by the store a couple of times. He could barely walk. And he seemed like an old man. But once he got in front of the people, mm -hmm. he was somebody different because that turned him on. You know what I mean? And then he started going into his rap act. Yeah, well, he, he was the king of the toast. Rudy and, Ray Moore. And Rudy Ray Moore, a.k.a. Dolomite, um, legendary uh, West Coast comedian. And, uh, you know, if you're talking about independent filmmakers and just having audacity... You know, here's a guy, he, he he couldn't sing, he couldn't rap, he couldn't act, but he put out records, he put out movies, and he had a long career in show business, and what's really, the reason we're talking about him today is because um, a video label uh, called Vinegar Syndrome has just reissued four, the four seminal Dolomite movies, uh, remastered them not only in DVD, but in Blu-ray as combo packs with tons of extras and Charles and I had a chance to preview these things and and we'll we'll go through the the lineage uh you know so what what more can you say uh about Rudy Ray Moore I can give you some facts he's born in um well, tell you, Arkansas um, in 1927 and he passed away in 2008 at the age of 81 well Rudy Rudy Ray Moore's films it's interesting because what happens is he is a clear example mm. of how you can profit over the zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. You know, the, um, black exploitation. Uh, it was a time when people wanted to see themselves on the screen in a heroic way. You know, mm -hmm. for too long, as I said, gr growing up, all I would see is if anybody did me wrong, if Whitey did me wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't do anything about it on that screen. I couldn't hit back or anything. If anyone had to take a, my cause, it had to be the white hero. Mm -hmm. And so we had it in kung fu movies, and then in black exploitation films, we had the underdog mm -hmm. c coming, rising on top, and they made money. And all of a sudden, people say, "Oh, man, this stuff is selling." Mm -hmm. Throw something together, put me some N-I-G-G-R stuff together. Let's capitalize on this. Now, Rudy Ray Moore was popular as a, as a rapper. He's doing what they would call the ghetto circuit. Well, party records. He was one yeah. of the original guys, along with Red Fox and, and other people, that basically put out dirty records to and were sold under the counter at record stores. Did you have a few Rudy Ray Moore? Oh, yeah, because we used to love the... <laughs> <laughs> the risque covers they had. Yeah, well, Rudy Ray Moore, he took it one further than Red Fox because all his covers were rated X and... and uh, Wild Man Steve. Put himself as a positioned himself as a ladies' man in all the covers. And, um, uh, but, uh, you know, so... But his main... And, and there's a very interesting documentary, I mean, I, called uh, The Legend of Dolomite, which was put out by Xenon. But what's really cool in these bo in this Blu-ray set, it's four different DVDs that you can buy individually. And as a bonus on each one, there's a 20-minute version of a new documentary called I, Dolomite, which basically traces his career from basically a guy who was, was an assistant manager at Dolphin's Record Store in Los Angeles. You know, he, and he had aspirations to be a recording artist. Like if you go all the way back to like the late 50s, he's singing jump blues. You know, he's like a Louis Jordan or, um, you know, like a smooth Charles Brown kind of like West Coast R&B singer. Uh, but then he, he didn't really make it in show business. We always had a foot in the door in show business. And then one day, this drunk guy came in and he started doing toasts. And um, he, he was always, he's like the neighborhood wino, and he would do these toasts. And, and the, the signifying monkey and, and the dolomite raps were the things that everybody would remember and he'd laugh at. And Rudy Moore, he said, hey, you know, I got an idea. Why don't you come over to my house? And he got him drunk and he, he basically had the guy do all his routines into a tape recorder, and then he 
took the tape recorder and went into a nightclub and started doing the act, became a million seller. He started pressing his own records and it was it actually charted uh, on Billboard, the first Stone White album, and then from there it was off to the races. And this is like 1970 or so when that first Stone White record came out. And by 1975, Rudy Ray Morris said, "Well, you know, what's the next thing we can do? We can make a movie." Mm -hmm. And he he took a hundred thousand dollars of his own money, and he had a, a gentleman, um, Derville Martin, who, who he can fill us in on. Well, Derville Martin is someone, you know, um, he wanted to be. In acting, it was difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there's some films he did, a lot of people don't even know he was in them, but the thing is, Duvel became more popularly known as the the good friend of Fred Williamson mm -hmm. when they would do their films. Um, Sidekick with the Nigger Sidekick, Charlies. yeah. yeah. Uh, Boss Nigger. Mm -hmm. You know, um, even Duvel helped produce The Final Come Down mm -hmm. um, with. Um, Billy D. Williams, mm -hmm. you know, but but and then he did also he was part producer of Disco Nine Thousand, and he did mm -hmm. some directing. But he's someone on it's a certain a level. Scene. There was a certain scene going on. Yeah, at that certain time. level. He got into production as well. Right. So he he was hired to direct the first Dolomite movie, um, which uh, is insane. This is Rudy Ray Moore, better known as Dolomite. Now I'd like to show you just a few scenes from my latest adventure. Damn, look like my women is on time. Babe, I could show sure warm you up. No shit, baby. I can dig it. Dolomite is my name and f***ing up motherfuckers is my game. Breathing down your neck. Damn! Damn! Girl, this motherfucker's got rhythm, haven't <laughs> I always say that if I ever ran a movie studio, mm -hmm. Dolomite would have a five-picture deal. Because these movies, if you've never seen a Dolomite movie, they're unlike anything else that exists in cinema. I'm talking world cinema, not just American cinema. It's just, And it's sort of like... I mean, maybe a, a stretch would be a movie like Darktown Strutters. I mean, like you're saying, they were making so much money during the black exploitation era that if you just made something with a bunch of black folks in it, you could you could get it made. You know? Yeah. So in the first Dolomite, so Dol Dolomite is a nightclub performer, but he's in jail on trumped up charges, and um, the Queen Bee, uh, along with another detective, uh, say like, "Look, you know, there's some things going on, and only you can." figure out how what the, what the deal is. So we're gonna let you out of jail for a, f a few weeks uh, so you, you can find out who the real criminal is, which turns out to be Derville Martin, and um, and get the goods on him. And Was then, that mean Willie Green? <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so, so, you know, so as soon as Dolomite gets out of jail, he, he strips naked in front of the jail and puts on his pimp clothes, and now he's, he's off in action and um, he's in, in, in the meantime, he's being caught up on by, by Queen Bee, his right hand man, his bottom bitch, tells him, like, look, you know, th these girls, they all know karate. When you were doing your time, I put your girls through karate school, and they are good, too. I remember one time a trick came in here and tried to misuse us. <laughs> what happened to my hundred dollars, Joe? Nigga, did you take my money? <laughs> That's right, little bitch. I took it back. He ain't worth no hundred dollars. I am Joe Blow, the lover man. You should be paying me, bitch. Give me my money, man. Shit, what money? Should I get cut like you all day, a dime a dozen, shit. Here, here's two dollars. Go get you some dish powder and keep it clean for me next time. And he whipped his ass. All I know, just Dolomite, technically, Mm -hmm. What made Dolomite popular was this cat was the funniest looking thing. With <laughs> it, it, you know, his outfits, mm -hmm. you know, the movie, you know, he do it, you know, that's, you know, the people used to say, we're going to smoke us a joint, drink us some cheap wine, and we're going to put on Dolomite and have a ball. Or, or when we went to the movies, it was so bad, it was good. Right. But I mean, it's, it's so it's so bad that it's good <laughs> that it's good. 
like you know I think the first time I saw a, Do a Dolomite movie I mean it's just so now you saw what the first time the first time I saw a Dolomite movie when they first came out on VHS from Xenon video see, in the late 80s see your, your experience is different than mine we, but I, I was still like we're seeing them in, in the theater okay you know and, 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 and seeing it in the theater you know that theater experiences where everyone's just goofing off and oh my god don't, don't, oh man, what's, what's my man wearing and then there's one scene where he's taking off his chest because here's a guy, when you look at him, mm -hmm. okay? Now, I don't want to get into cultural standards, all right? But by cinema standards, one white reviewer, mm -hmm. or a, fe a female white, I think it was Pauline Kael. <laughs> Pauline Kael yeah. had to watch the <laughs> Okay. She all said right. he has got to be the ugliest leading man in the history of cinema. Now, I know you think you're smart, see, because you got all them flashy clothes, you got that big car there, you got all them black bitches working for you. You forgot about the white ones. You move your ass out of this town and you move it fast. And just to show you that we mean business. <laughs> That's for fucking with me, you no business born insecure motherfuckers. But that's the audacity of Dolabite. I mean, it's just like it's America. You can do anything if you just put your weight on it. Because this man, he not only convinced himself that he would, could star in a movie, but he got a whole crew of people and then a bunch of women to stand around him naked and make him a sex god for, for four movies. There's even the, a scene where he takes off his shirt. And my boy's got some phony hair on his chest. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so moving moving on. So Dolmite, you know, not it, you know, it's a great entree into the into the scene. It's later Black Sweat Taste in nineteen seventy five, but it made so much money. Yes, that um, the next year they came back with what I think is the quintessential. Like if you if you only see one Dolmite movie in your life, you have to experience Human Tornado. You know what's interesting? You said it made so much money. Mm -hmm. And everything's relative, but mm -hmm. what was so much money back then? Well, the movie only cost a hundred thousand, so it probably made a million. I, I would guess, you know, enough M to maybe them three, four million, and that was considered a lot. Four or five million, you know? Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, but it was successful enough to keep him going. Yes. So, so uh, the quintessential Dolomite movie is Human Tornado. I mean, it snakes and twice as bad. But for the price of admission, I can be had. If you crave satisfaction, this is the place to find that action. Coming to this theater as its next attraction is the picture that will put you in faction. The human tornado. He made me do it. Bitch, are you for real? <laughs> Motherfucker caught me in the bed with his wife. Now he want to try to take my life. <laughs> <laughs> so in in this one, um, once again, he's a pimp. <laughs> um, and in in the um, opening scene, he's uh, caught in bed by the sheriff, uh, having sex with the sheriff's wife. And um, so the sheriff, he's so he's so racist and enraged that he orders his deputy to just shoot his wife dead because he's she's spoiled. He can't do anything, and and uh, well, right not before he catches catches him in bed with his wife, and Dolmite, um, you know, and she's and he's basically a gigolo because Dol she's like, hey, you're the you're the best man I ever pay for, right? So they're getting down, and all of a sudden the sheriff comes in, and he sees him in bed, and she cries rape. Yeah, and she said, he said, bitch, are you rape. You kidding, bitch? You know. <laughs> so he he dodges, get out of the way. She gets killed. He jumps out the jumps off a cliff into some bushes. <laughs> so you know it's already fun, right? Because and, and so well, he he jumped out of the bush and into the bushes. Huh? But, uh, uh, jumped out of bush into the bush. <laughs> but then but then you know you're in for a Dolomite movie because he's like, wait, y'all didn't believe I did this? I'm gonna rewind this and play it again. <laughs> So y'all don't believe I jumped, huh? So watch this good shit!
Yeah, so now Dolomite's on the run. He goes to L.A. and he hooks up with the Queen Bee. And um, and now the mob is in on trying to get after their club. So not only does he have to fight the mob with Kung Fu, mm -hmm. but he's also... Um, in, uh, the sheriff is in cahoots with... Uh, with the local police force who's trying to catch Dolomite. So he shows up in LA and he's like, look, you gotta get this guy. You know, he raped my wife and killed her, all, all that other stuff. I mean, you know, whatever trumped up charges. So now there's a double-edged sword that he's gotta fight against. And, um, you know, lots lots of opportunities for, for him to rap and do all that kind of craziness and have sex with white women. And Human Tornado, um, he actually has a, he plays a character, Door to Door Salesman. Uh, you know he's got to he's got to go to because he he's trying to info, trying to find out where the mob has stolen his bitches, like uh, they they're they, they, they're they all in a torture two. they kidnap a bunch of his hoes two of them two of them and and they're in a torture chamber and so he goes to the junkie and he says like look they're in a torture chamber you know it's like he's like well what you know tell me where they're at you know and he's like uh, he's like I wouldn't know but. Um, you gotta go. You gotta see the mob guy's wife. So he he knocks on the door. He's a he's a door to door salesman, he's a a painter of erotic paintings. And I don't know where the hell they found this painting, but I know in in the real black world, if anybody had that exact <laughs> painting, I would pay a million dollars for it because it's a piece of uh, history. Yeah. Um. And then he he infiltrates the mob by having sex with the woman and and knock the ceiling off the wall and all kinds of stuff and and the blu-ray you got to check out because there's a whole story about how they design the sets and all that kind of stuff well and and the thing is what made those films popular is you had the, the typical tropes mm -hmm. um the kung fu mm -hmm. the sexy women mm -hmm. the black and white sex and um with with what made Dolomite so popular is the rap because a lot of guys rap became very popular. What really is the reason? One of the reasons why you, you, you're getting Dolomite on Blu-ray. Mm -hmm. You know he's a cult figure, but he was so big with the rappers. The same way like Scarface. Mm -hmm. You know you you always see this picture of um, Scarface and and a lot of the um, rappers. Yeah, a lot. Of big Daddy Kane actually featured Dolomite on some work because he had he had a big resurgence in the '80s with the rediscovery of him on home video. And what one of the things that's really important to know is that um, he controlled his masters. Mm -hmm. You know, he was he was an astute businessman. Now, I mean, some of the movies he got the rights back because the companies went out of business. But here is a, a black independent filmmaker in Los Angeles who is. Uh, self-producing, self-financing, and basically self-distributing not only his records, but motion pictures. Yeah. And he did so um, for a, a nice period, about five or six years. If you count the records, uh, almost a decade, he was a self-made man. Kind of reminiscent of what made Oscar Michaud a success. You know, mm -hmm. Oscar Michaud was into book pu book publishing. Mm -hmm. And so he knew how you know to put a product together, go on the road, sell it, and then um, you go from literature to the the, the next art medium of film, mm -hmm. and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. and, and, it's and, so not, and not far from what what Tyler Perry has done from taking plays and, yes. and translating them to film. So, and in some ways, he's a mogul. I mean, he never made great riches, and and we'll, we'll move forward uh, with the next film, which is uh, Petey Wheatstraw, the Devil's Son-in-Law. The Devil's Son-in-Law. <laughs> Yes, I'm Petey Wheatstraw, the devil's son-in-law, the high sheriff of hell. I went with notorious Fanny and even made love to old Lulaville. I took today and brought back yesterday, took the 4th of July and put it in June. And made leap year jump over the moon. These are unabashedly black movies, just from the, the pure sense that these, the whole Dolomite thing is based on classic toasts. You know, it's an oral tradition that has existed in black culture for centuries. You know, the, yeah, yeah. the ability to toast. Well, you just said um, unabashedly black, right? Mm -hmm. 
And what I would um, tell a lot of people, what you know, what's beautiful about today's technology, it yeah. allows them to do the research mm -hmm. that when I was doing my research years ago, the accessibility wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Now it's a, yeah. Google did boo 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 boo, you know. But the thing is. Mm -hmm. um, Ebony, you don't have to go buy the Ebony's or try to, I used to have to go to um, mm -hmm. old bookstores mm -hmm. to get back back issues. Now you go right on online. Yeah, Google. Um, go and research um, culture or con game in Ebony mm -hmm. where they're discussing, you know, is this culture or a con game? You know, you know, mm -hmm. is this really something we need to watch? But, you know. Well, I mean, if people are concerned with authorship, you know, the, the black producer, black actor, black stars. I mean, some, probably some white money. You know, the, get a hundred thousand dollars is a little tough. But and then certainly white distribution. But they at that point they, it was like a license to print money. Mm -hmm. The way they were doing these things. So you know, but yeah, all, the the le, the oral tradition of toasting. You know, it, it, you know the dolomite and the signify monkey is is um, are, are classic things. You know, so um, I guess the dolomite was. Uh, and shine on the Titanic. That's what I'm thinking of. That's uh, that's another classic toast. It's about the black guy, cook on the Titanic who, who gets away. You know. So, in all of the uh, Rudy Ray Moore's depictions of Dolomite, there's a level of trickster in the character where where he, on some level, I mean, he's using his power and his limited acting skills to take on the man, but he's also um, using his guile, you know, mm -hmm. like in order to get inside things, and you know, the, such as depicted in, in the, you know, knocking on and, and his sexual prowess. I mean, so which and, is and a, that's which interesting. Is that's interesting. Um, you, you just said the trickster, mm -hmm. and that's how many people, um, when they wanted to, kind of, give a a, a raison d'etre to what we got in black films. Mm -hmm. It was about in literature when you first had uh, an attempt to write black literary characters, mm -hmm. there was always a fascination with the trickster. Mm -hmm. Now listen, I can figure out a way to keep from marrying the devil's daughter, but the main thing we got to deal with Leroy and Skillet right now. But Petey, I'm scared. Now you know how powerful the devil is, and if you cross him, he's gonna be mad as hell. I mean, heaven. Oh, shit. Oh, Nell, you always were, and you know I can take care of things. Blacks have always found a way to get over, mm -hmm. you know, get over on the man and whatnot. And okay. the trickster, that was what was popular in a lot of these black exploitation films where you had the superfly characters, mm -hmm. you had um, the Dolomite characters, guys who were just cool and they be just became legendary in, in the hood, you know. Man, mm -hmm. them guys are cool. But, you know, from the consciousness of those who felt, is this where we want? Well, are, are these the models we want for our kids? Well, that that brings up a good point. So I wasn't there. I was I was a little. I was like ba barely a, 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 a dream in my daddy's balls when these Dolomite movies were coming out. Mm -hmm. So um, I mean, clearly there's dichotomy. There's all kinds of representation. Like if you were just to watch a Dolomite movie with the sound down, how much visually is accurate to the times, and how much of it is it just uh, fabrication? I mean, is it? How much is documentary, I, I guess you should say, in terms of what that era felt like, what it looked like, how people acted and behaved? Well, the whole thing is, what I was touching on is is, is the problem of spectatorship mm -hmm. and how as a people who, based on white supremacy, mm -hmm. we are not able to live the way we should be able to live. Mm -hmm. And so there are a number of people from a, a black consciousness, a black nationalistic perspective, where they say, we don't have the time for this nonsense. Mm -hmm. Where you have other people who say, hey, we, we're just like anyone else, and mm -hmm. why not give us some opportunity to escape like anyone else, because we need it. Mm -hmm. So that's always the war. Yeah, I mean, clearly, if, you, if you're objective, yeah, it's Kuhn stuff going on in that movie but it also feels in these particular films and and we didn't even touch on Cliff Rockmore who was the director of the the final three Dolomite movies you know he came out of theater um, I think I think that there is a legitimate effort to represent a world there like even the characters it's maybe a little amplified and cartoonish 
you know, but. Now, Cliff Rockmore, if I'm not mistaken, going because this is going back research, but um, he was married to one of the actresses. And I think so. Yeah. Okay, she's the one um, who played in Sound of Part Two. She was mm -hmm. she she did the Cicely Tyson role. Mm -hmm. I can't think of a name right now, but the beauty of black exploitation was that you can have opportunities made available to a Cliff Rockamore, where a black can be in the position of direction mm -hmm. and, and, and having that input. And mm -hmm. that was the greatness of it. Yeah, and, and the bonus features, they actually talk, he's passed away many years ago, but they, they have interviews with his two sons who are featured in uh, one of the Dolomite movies, you know, as, as kid actors. I think, I think it's Human Tornado. But yeah, I mean, I so, I, you know, I I can't get enough of this stuff. I mean, this was like, you know, um, I'm always getting on Criterion Collection for not putting out more black films, but who needs Criterion let when me you just got ask you, Syndrome? Let me be devil's advocate mm -hmm. right quick. Yeah. Real Black, mm -hmm. The Mission, mm -hmm. and we're watching films now that are coming out, and Real Black is saying, mm, when the bow breaks, mm, I want it more. Mm -hmm. Put yourself back in my place mm -hmm. in the 70s, mm -hmm. and I'm watching Dolomite. Do I make that distinction with, can you see, can you see what Dolomite is and it's, it's, well, it's what it is? How would you compare it to something that may come out now and you could find something on that level as being inexcusable from the from the handiwork of blacks. Well, I mean, it's, if if you want to draw the direct comparison, the parody of Dolomite is Black Dynamite. Mm -hmm. You know, and people enjoy that. I mean, there's, there's and that didn't do any any money. It didn't make any money, but yeah. it spawned a whole series on on Cartoon Network. It, it's a huge cult favorite. People love Michael Jai White. I mean, you know, a lot of a lot of a lot of stuff isn't necessarily designed for the masses and. And so only certain people are going to get it, you know. So even like Black Jesus, you know, it took me a while to get that. It took me a while to get the boondocks. But the fact that that stuff exists and it's it's satire and it speaks to a very specific representation of the community, I think is valid. Um, when the Bow Breaks is just sort of a, a white film in blackface. It, they're there exploiting me for my money because they know that I I really have a desire to see Taraji Henson, Morris Chestnut, Idris Elba in a, a escapist form of entertainment because I, I like them as actors. But the problem with those movies is they're not, they don't put enough, they put more money into the poster than they do the actual scripts. And that's not something that generally happens when you see a a uh, white thriller with fairly major name actors that makes it to a theater. You know, I mean, that when the bow breaks, if that shit was on Showtime or Lifetime or whatever, you know, I there'd be no issue to complain. But the fact that they're asking me to spend my $13, that's where I have a problem. Now, if you're talking about representation and stereotypes and all that stuff, I look at Dolomite in a, its very own specific galaxy. The fact that there's no reason why in, in, a, in a commercial environment that a movie as crazy as Do a Dolomite would even exist, let alone four movies. And the fact that it's been rediscovered by a generation um, and it has some cult appeal, I think is fascinating. I, I put Rudy Ray Moore right next to a Russ Meyer, you know, who was another independent filmmaker out of LA who made Use, use his own resources and financing to make better made movies than Dolomite, but a whole series of sexploitation things. You know, and, and I'm, I'm generally a, a big fan of that sort of outsider exploitation cinema be, in the cases where it's not just pure exploitation, but there's some artistry behind it. That's why I was so excited when we had a chance to talk to Jack Hill on the radio show, because here's a guy who basically was a contemporary of Francis Ford Coppola, but somehow he got saddled into doing low-budget exploitation film. And the reason why you can still look at a coffee today 
has as much to do with Pam Greer as it does Jack Hill as it does to Pam Greer because he he was looking at the opportunity within those resources they had to actually make something good. Whereas if you asked me to do a critique on Bad, the Black, and the Beautiful, I don't think I could do it. Right. If that if that shit was coming out on Blu-ray, I'd say use it as a coaster. But not to belabor a point, but um, right. Birth of a Nation makes how much money? Um, at this point, it's it's around seventeen million. Seventeen. At the, as of today, it'll probably get a, get close to about twenty twenty five. Okay, great. And um, Boo comes out and makes how much? Opening weekend was twenty seven. Okay, twenty nine. 27, 29. 27 opening weekend. It's, it's, as we speak, it's, it, it has just crossed 30 million. So, so we can have Boo? You don't mind if, if we get Boo? Well, I mean, you know, people know what they're getting in for. I'm not necessarily somebody that's going to say, go spend $13 on Would Boo. Would you say, like, Boo is, like, compared to coming out at the time of a birth of a nation the same way, like... A dolomite would come out with a sounder. Well, I mean, if we're going to go in, well, absolutely, yes. And I would say, you know, for those who are Tyler Perry fans, Boo is probably the craziest Tyler Perry movie ever because it's like he just doesn't care anymore. He's just going <laughs> to give you entertainment, and and you're either with him or you're against him. I, he's he's really s basically abandoned any effort to to give you anything more than what you what you want. And yeah, I mean, in some ways, the Medea character, there's a direct corollary between that and what, what Dolomite represented in the 70s. You know, but, you know, um, I don't, having grown up in this time, I mean, maybe in 20 years or 30 years, Tyler Perry will be up for major rediscovery and people will be looking at Tyler Perry as, as a, a genius. I don't know. Time will tell. But I, I'm, I'm just super super happy that uh, Dolomite has finally made it to Blu-ray in a legitimate special edition. For you know me, what I, I, you I, know sep what? I separate Dolomite as its own entity mm -hmm. within that era, but they're just crazy movies. Disco Godfather! Let's keep and creep the Disco Godfather! The last one is the most bizarre movie because now it's PG rated Dolomite and he's fighting crime. He's 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 a one man war on drugs, right? So um, it's and the original title was Disco Godfather, and then um, they but you know and they they planned it in '78. It got released in '79. So. Um, and it was basically trying to fight Angel Dust. Like, Angel Dust was the big drug on the street at that time. So Dolomite, he, he discovers that uh, his, uh, his nephew is hooked on Angel Dust. And he says, where is Bucky? And what has he did? <laughs> right? And then and, um, he goes and uh, gets the... He gets the uh, so he finds out that... Uh, I don't want to spoil it. But he finds out that one of, one of the local sort of like heroes is involved with the drug trafficking so he gets together and and fights it and everything but the the but it it really completely destroyed Dolmite's career and he's very open about it he's very bitter about it because um they they invested w way more money in it than they had before and um but it was a message film and people don't want that and then the other thing was it had disco in the title so that was a hot thing in 78 but by 79, you know, disco sucks, all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. So it just completely bombed. He, he lost all his money. Um, and he never made another movie again. Not until the 80s when they did some straight-to-video things. But, but um, it's, it's just a, it's a strange movie because they have no money, but they're trying to recreate drug trips. And there's... Uh, you know, there, there's this this whole thing where he he runs. He's the Godfather of disco. Like yeah. the whole opening where he's like showing his belt and dance and stuff. I mean, it's clear he has no moves at all. <laughs> but he's he's like you know, if you put if you put Dolomite doing God disco Godfather next to John Travolta in Saturday Night Fever, you'd be like, what the fuck does this guy? What what is he on? You know, that makes him think he can get away with this and, stuff. And one of the things about that film that they paid a lot of attention 
to try to make him look real. Oh, yeah, he's got a wig or some kind of jerry curl thing and his mustache. And Eyeliner and, oh, my <laughs> goodness, you know what I mean? You know, they worked on this, try to uh, improve his looks or whatever. Sure. But um, that that was a, a bomb, real bomb. There's yeah. so many things that, that went against it being mm -hmm. a success. But yeah. I think what's interesting is um, you always want to look at who else is featured in these films. Mm -hmm. um, who played Bucky? Where is Bucky and what has he had? The actor who played Bucky, many people confuse him with Tony Todd. Mm -hmm. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the old guys, getting old, the minds, but I believe Bucky is the guy who did the role in The Last Dragon. The, okay. the, um, Shona? Shona. Okay. Bucky! Bucky! Mm -hmm. The doctor said you was gonna be all right. What? What about my arm, man? Bucky, what are you talking about? How can I play when I ain't got no... <laughs> There's a scene in, um, just one anecdotal. There's a, uh, because I'm seeing this in the theater. Um, the Devil's Son-in-Law, the Peter Witch Peter 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 Draw. Mm. Now, Cliff Rockamore, you, you can research um, the actress who played Sounder 2. Mm -hmm. But there's a scene where she's on the bed, and they start where the guy's kissing up her, her leg, mm -hmm. right? Her bare leg. And he's kissing up the leg, and, and, and we're in the audience. We say, ooh, ooh, we hear there's just a, um, one united, ooh, you know. Yeah. Ooh, and as he's getting close and close, ooh, 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 and then when he gets to her face, people say, oh, ugh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, my goodness. Well, that, that's, that had to that's, be. That's the other thing. I mean, that had to be embarrassing because Cliff Rock, Rockamore, if he did a, um, you know how they do testing for, mm -hmm. for films? That had to be not only embarrassing for him, but I felt very, a lot of, pain for maybe um, the actress who was his wife mm -hmm. you know because you know that we have this this European culture the standard mm -hmm. and so she's very dark and mm -hmm. so you know we growing up on, on a mm -hmm. standard and they'll look at her as like she was right. ugly well well she you know she she didn't have to be in the theater wh while you were watching it. but I mean one one of the funniest things in a Dolomite movie is in human tornado um, when uh, he he hooks up with this girl, I mean, and some of the sex scenes are played off as, as fantasies and, and things like that. Like uh, when Cliff Rockmore takes over the the franchise, he he injects he 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 takes a, a the next step further in terms of cartoonish and and not necessarily. Although Peter Wheatstraw is a little more grounded in reality, but Human Tornado is even more crazy and comic book like. Almost like if you were watching a, a Funkadelic or Parliament. Uh, Album like mm -hmm. if, if a par if George Clinton came to life, he'd he'd probably make a Dolomite movie. But if he made a movie, it'd be like Dolomite would be in it. So there's one scene when he he hooks up with this girl in the bar, and they go go to the hotel or whatever to make out, and they start um, having sex, and then they're like, I guess he's going down on her, mm -hmm. and then they cut to them eating ribs together, <laughs> at the bar, and they're just like eating the ribs up, you know. But, so you never see anything, but when it cuts to the moment where you expect it, it's like. You know, he's <laughs> just just crazy. Just how do, how does stuff like this get made, and where does it come from? You know, the the whole thing with Dolomite, um, te te technically, they could be a half a star, mm -hmm. but the fun, the enjoyment you get out of it is mm -hmm. five stars because it's very hard not to just bust out cracking mm -hmm. off Dolomite, and and that's what makes. It's so unique and will go down in history. Yeah, and the first Dolomite, you know, so many people saw it in the VHS version, which was formatted square, because mm -hmm. it was shot square, but when in the theater, they cut off the top and bottom. So they actually give you the square version, which they call the boom mic edition, because like every other shot, there's a mic sticking out of the top of the frame. Um, and that's that's like a lot of people are like, uh, that's that's another reason for laughter. You could That could be a drinking game, you know, Take a shot every time you see a boom mic in the Dolomite movie, so. So 
So check those out. And shout out, thank you, Vinegar Syndrome, for sending those for us to preview. And, um, you know, it's, it's big It's big news. Don't mind on Blu-ray. Yeah. Um, see it at a theater near you. <laughs> or you put your weight on it. The reason why Donald Trump is where he's at, if we relate it to film, I think there's some films pe people need to see that point to the danger of why Donald Trump is so important with his cult of personality. What makes me mad is all the gangbangers, right? Mm -hmm. All the gangbangers that are supposed to be banging and shit. Okay, the cops are killing us. Why aren't you shooting at them for us? Mm. What, what happened, gangbangers? All of a sudden, they at home and shit. <laughs> Motherfuckers are at home. We're all these tough gangbangers. We need you. Hello. Hey, man, the Italians got mafia. Like, the Italians, you know what I love about the, the mafia and the Italians? They protect their neighborhoods. They protect their neighborhoods. They protect their people. We're the only motherfuckers that have no mafia. Black people don't got a mafia. We, don't have, we can't even organize crime. <laughs>